The majority of the world's attention was firmly focused on the tragic events occurring in Ukraine and Russia throughout 2022, but on the opposite side of Eurasia. North Korea had a very active year in 2022, and Kim Jong government UNs made the most of it by launching more missiles than ever before, at least 90 of them, eight of which were categorized as nuclear missiles. Intercontinental ballistic missiles, or ICBMs, were used in eight of these tests, with the most successful test occurring on March 24. From a location close to Pyongyang, the North fired an ICBM that traveled over 6,000 kilometers above the Earth's surface over the course of about 71 minutes. The missile then arced down and crashed into the Sea of Japan, just to the southwest of the Japanese island of Hokkaido. This test produced the highest altitude of a missile that North Korea has ever fired, and while analysis of the missile's trajectory and flight time suggests a disturbing new reality, it is likely that whatever missile the North Koreans fired here is capable of striking targets at a range of about 15,000 kilometers. This is alarming because it now puts almost the entire world outside of South America within North Korean ICBM range, which puts the entire world within the range of the country's nuclear weapons. Although it is unknown how powerful their upcoming test will be, it is evident that North Korea is making rapid advancements in its ability to deliver nuclear warheads on the tips of missiles, in addition to their development of strategic nuclear weapons that have the potential to theoretically deliver city-ending bombs to any location in the United States. Tactical nuclear weapons are the next item on North Korea's weapons checklist, and if they have them, anybody trying to overthrow the Kim dictatorship would face costs that are almost impossible to bear. Keep in mind that tactical nuclear weapons are quite different from strategic nuclear weapons in a few key respects. Tactical nukes may be launched as if they were artillery on the battlefield, and battlefield commanders can authorize their deployment. Tactical nukes are substantially smaller in size and shorter in range, and are only designed to be used to fulfill certain military goals. Contrast this with strategic nuclear weapons, which are the large, terrifying ICBMs that can travel across continents and completely destroy cities and whose use is typically only considered as a last resort. In the case of North Korea, these strategic nuclear weapons already exist, but they are largely ineffective for deterrence on their own in the event of an all-out war between North Korea and the rest of the world. One only needs to consider how quickly the United States overran Iraq in 2003 as a prime example. In a little over five weeks, the United States' overwhelming air superiority and accompanying ground invasion allowed them to topple Saddam Hussein's government and inflict tens of thousands of casualties on his technologically inferior army while only suffering less than 200 deaths themselves in the process. Strategic weapons alone still do very little to balance out this calculus work, which causes Kim to perceive an attack coming from the United States firing one of his strategic nukes across the Pacific to hit an American city somewhere would be guaranteed to entail a retaliatory strategic nuclear strike from the United States. Kim knows that in a limited shooting war with the United States without ever resorting to nukes his regime will probably get wiped out in a matter of weeks. Tactical nuclear weapons give the Kim regime a fleeting glimmer of hope that they could still win in the event that they have them and the Kim regime for whatever reason perceives an impending invasion or attack coming from the United States and or South Korea. Tactical nuclear weapons are loaded on a short range. North Korea is 100% certain to lose a conflict with the United States in a limited conventional war or in a strategic nuclear war. In addition, North Korea would keep all of its longer-range strategic nuclear weapons in reserve and on alert in an effort to, from their perspective, deter the United States from retaliating with its own strategic nuclear strikes. Should the United States do this, the North could theoretically launch its strategic nuclear weapons and strike a significant American city. However, it is unclear whether the North Korean intercontinental ballistic missiles could actually cross the Pacific. If the United States were to ever launch an attack into the country while making quick efforts to find and destroy all of the North's nuclear warheads before they could be deployed, there is always the chance that they might miss one or two that could then be launched at South Korea, Japan, or even the US mainland, an event that could potentially result in hundreds of thousands of casualties. Seoul one of the world's densest cities, Seoul lies just about 50 kilometers from the North Korean border. The metropolitan region around Seoul is home to over half of South Korea's population, or about 26 million people. 
These folks are all located well within striking distance of thousands of artillery pieces in the north. In the event of an all-out war continuing in Korea, North Korea's artillery could deliver tens of thousands of shells directly into Seoul within a few minutes of notice, resulting in apocalyptic levels of destruction. This effectively means that regardless of how it feels, Seoul is being held as a hostage at gunpoint by the North even before the North had nuclear weapons and before the ground war would start. South Korea even conducted a simulation on this exact scenario back in 2004 that estimated that within just the first 24 hours of a full-scale conflict with the North resuming, there would be up to 2 million casualties. This ultimately just means that there isn't any possible way to militarily resolve this conflict. In 2020, more than 88% of all North Korea's international trade was conducted exclusively with China, primarily made up of coal and mineral exports the North sells to China. The Chinese trade extensively with North Korea for a variety of reasons, but one of the main ones is that at least on paper, the North Koreans and Chinese are official nations. This enables them to bypass many of their international sanctions. Along with the United States, Japan, Australia, and South Korea, Taiwan, Japan, and South Korea which effectively functions as an island state due to its sealed off border in the north to the south are participants in the quadrilateral security dialogue. Vietnam is another significant potential ally of the United States due to its intense maritime disputes with China and the South China Sea. The United States military currently has no direct bases within any country that borders China directly by land, allowing China to maintain some sense of strategic depths separating their mainland from their main geopolitical rivals' armed forces. However, at the present time, North Korea and Taliban-ruled Afghanistan are the only two very notable exceptions to this rule, and Russia and, of course, North Korea. In their wake, the South Korean and or American militaries may be seizing the opportunity to advance into North Korea in order to restore order and unite the peninsula under the democratic regime of Seoul. If that were to happen without the Chinese intervening, the American military would be capable for the very frightful event that millions of impoverished North Korean refugees flood into northeast China on a mass scale. In addition to having the third largest stockpile of chemical and biological weapons in the world after the United States and Russia, North Korea also has a number of nuclear weapons. In the event of a complete state collapse, any number of these weapons of mass destruction could be lost or acquired by an unforeseen faction or terrorist group during the chaos, and those groups may or may not use them in China's neighborhood or even against China itself. If North Korea were to abruptly fall, China would have to cope with all three of these horrible possibilities, and the Kim dictatorship is well aware of its power over Beijing. Despite its shared grievances with North Korea, China really has no option but to keep supporting North Korea financially and militarily, at least until a period when the state won't be certain to collapse and create all of these issues. China is almost impossible to convince to cooperate on financial sanctions against North Korea because Beijing uses two destabilizing factors, almost all of North Korea's trade is with China, and China prefers the status quo within the Korean peninsula with as few changes made as possible. North Korea is basically capable of just blackmailing China into continuing to support them. This is another reason why anyone planning to assassinate Kim Jong-un isn't a good idea even if it were successful level, the assassination would probably only result in one of two outcomes one Kim Jong-un is removed from power but the nation rallies around one of his other family members who survives and maintains the dynasty's grip on power possibly his sister and current apparent successor Kim Yo-jong. Assassinating the country's head of state the North agreed to freeze their nuclear weapons. Program in exchange for alternative fuel supplies from the United States and eventual normalization of relations in the 1994 framework agreed upon by the Clinton administration. That deal, however, would not last very long by 2002 a new president was in the White House who in the wake of the September 11th attacks would label North Korea, along with Iran and Iraq, as being part of the axis of evil. North Korea's government is armed with missiles and WMDs while its people are hungry. Iran actively seeks these weapons and sells terrorism, while an unelected minority suppress the aspirations for freedom of the Iranian people. Iraq continues to show its hatred for the United States and support for terrorism. For more than a decade, the Iraqi leadership has planned to create anthrax, nerve gas, and nuclear weapons. 
States like these and their terrorist allies make up an axis of evil that is armed and ready to threaten global peace by pursuing WMD. These regimes pose a serious and increasing threat, and throughout 2002, it became clear that the Bush administration was preparing to launch a full-scale invasion of one of those members, Iraq. The United States invaded Iraq just a few months after Saddam Hussein's Iraq abandoned its nuclear weapons program, and North Korea, seeing the writing on the wall, decided to formally withdraw from the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty in January 2003, becoming the only nation to have ever signed it. Shortly after North Korea withdrew, the United States invaded Iraq, and North Korea would successfully detonate their first nuclear weapon. Both Muammar Gaddafi's Libya, which NATO attacked in 2011 after the country agreed to end its nuclear weapons program in 2003, and Ukraine, which Russia attacked in 2014 and again in 2022 after the latter country surrendered about 1,700 nuclear warheads in 1994 in exchange for security guarantees that were obviously broken, have experienced nuclear-related attacks. These three instances have made it very evident to the Kim dictatorship that giving up nuclear weapons leaves nations vulnerable to adversarial foreign forces, and the current situation between Russia and Ukraine serves as yet another illustration of this. Out of concern about Russia's nuclear weapons, the conventionally superior United States and NATO have all declined to impose a no-fly zone over Ukraine or to actively confront a Russian force. Arsenal stands in sharp contrast to American quick actions against adversaries without nuclear deterrent in Afghanistan and Iraq Libya what options, if any, does that even leave for dealing with North Korea at this point? The truth is that by this point there aren't many. The Kim regime knows that its nuclear weapons are its shield against any interventions coming from the West and convincing them otherwise through diplomacy, economic sanctions, or military intervention is almost certain to be a fool's errand especially while the United States maintains an aggressive posture in South Korea. The population of South Korea is now going through a crisis. South Korea currently has a population that is roughly twice that of North Korea, but over the next few years, South Korea's population will decline while North Korea's population will remain more or less constant. South Korea has the lowest fertility rate of any nation in the world, with South Korean women having an average of just 1.1 children per woman. This trend has been building for decades. This is the population pyramid of South Korea on the right and this is the population pyramid of North Korea over on the left. The most fascinating thing to draw from this data is that despite the South's overall population being about twice that of the North right now in 2023. North Korean women are still, on average, giving birth to roughly twice as many children as South Korean women are, at about 1.9 births per woman. If these trends continue, the number of men of military age in both countries will have effectively equalized within just 20 to 30 years, negating the South's advantage in manpower that it currently enjoys. This is especially true given that the North employs much harsher conscription laws than the South, with roughly 6 million children under the age of 14 in North Korea and 6.2 million in South Korea. According to current projections, the population of South Korea will drop from 52 million to 44 million in 30 years, with 40% of the 44 million people who will still be living there over the age of 64 being retired and no longer contributing to the economy. This will leave only about 26 million South Koreans under the age of 64 supporting 18 million seniors in retirement compared to the 43 million South Koreans under the age of 64. Sustaining just 9 million retirees today, some that's risky economic arithmetic for sale. North Korea will probably remain more or less the same as it is today, which really just means that North Korea's best strategy to continue fighting the Korean War is basically to simply do nothing and wait out the next 20 to 30 years while its manpower advantages are still in play. South Korea's export-driven economy is at some risk of failing unless they turn to immigration to replace the workers they're losing or adapt with some kind of worker automation. Because South Korea has very little influence over the United States, it is concerned about the growing danger posed by North Korea's rockets and bellicose statements. Due to China's increasing expansionism and the possibility that the United States may not take its security guarantees as seriously as previously thought, the United States may need to be ready for North Korea to no longer be the only nuclear-armed state on the Korean peninsula. 
This is because, according to a poll conducted in February 2022, a nearly overwhelming 71% of South Koreans were in favor of their country acquiring nuclear weapons, while only 18% of North Koreans agreed. It has been at a standstill for the past 70 years and is likely to remain at a standstill for the foreseeable future, but that doesn't mean that outbreaks of violence between the two sides never happen. Since the turn of the 21st century, there have been dozens of reported incident skirmishes and defection attempts between the two Koreas that have occasionally gotten dreadfully close to restarting the all-out war. The most frightening incident was the defection attempt that resulted one of the most intriguing, bloody, and divisive battles of the 20th and 21st centuries has without a doubt been the contemporary continuation of the Cold War in Korea, but YouTube's rules of service prevent me from covering it in any sort of depth there. Because of the controversial topics I'm covering, this video already has a very high chance of being demonetized and unpromoted by YouTube's algorithm, but the moment I really delve into the history of the Korean conflict in the 21st century at what stake, why it all started, how it's been fought, and how it all led to where we are today, this video will definitely be demonetized and unpromoted. The best way to access Nebula and all of this amazing exclusive content is through our sponsor CuriosityStream, and with their current sales price, it costs less than 15 per year to have full access to both of them. In addition, CuriosityStream has some really great and timely content that you're sure to enjoy, such as Machinery of War, a fantastic three-part series with 50-minute episodes that explores how war is waged. Beyond merely real-life lore, so please make sure to do so by clicking this button right now on your computer, which will lead you to curiositystream.com real life lore, or by clicking the link that is provided in the description below. As usual, I appreciate you watching.